In the 20th century, the Earth is under siege by an alien mineral called Tiberium, which destroys the natural environment of the planet, making it inhospitable for all carbon-based life. This infestation has caused the breakdown of much of society, with the majority of the human population living in squalor, outside the safety of the last areas of Earth left unaffected by its spread. In addition, the Brotherhood of Nod, a faction of fanatics who view Tiberium as the next evolution of humanity, use propaganda, fear, and chaos to recruit new and desperate members into their organization. Amongst all this chaos and uncertainty, one force stands to protect humanity from the Brotherhood and halt the spread of Tiberium throughout the globe. That force is the Global Defense Initiative. The origins of the Global Defense Initiative, or GDI for short, date back to the Second World War between the Allied Western nations of Europe and the Soviet Union in the late 1940s. At one point during the conflict, the Soviets were in the process of invading Greece. By spring 1948, the Soviets had reached the outskirts of Athens, where a full siege of the city began. The Allied Greek forces were able to hold off the Soviet advance on the city, resulting in a stalemate. But the Soviets decided to switch up tactics, and instead of just focusing on the city, targeted important cultural heritage sites in order to break the morale of the defenders. The tactic worked, as the Acropolis of Athens was destroyed. Shortly afterward, the remaining Allied forces retreated from the city, and later, all of Greece, giving the Soviets total control over the country. While this was a major victory for the Soviets, it was also the catalyst for their eventual defeat in the war. Government leaders have abandoned the capital and are now hiding in exile. Information out of occupied Athens has been sporadic, but Soviet forces are indeed in control of the capital as well as much of the outlying territories in Greece. In the city, fighting among Allied and Soviet troops continues, but the Allied death toll is rising rapidly. Now it remains to be seen if Allied forces will be able to weather this onslaught intact. Reacting to this latest assault, Allied diplomats led the United Nations in a 281-7 vote that, in approving a unique military funding initiative, aimed at increasing global Allied support. This proposal calls for the formation of a global defense agency to be temporarily established in an as-yet unnamed European capital. The destruction of the Acropolis, as well as the large amount of civilian deaths during the siege, turned the rest of the global community, not involved in the war, fully against the Soviets. Allied diplomats in the United Nations received overwhelming support for a resolution that called for the temporary establishment of a worldwide defense agency. This office was aptly named the United Nations Global Defense Agency. Although this new agency was formed with the intention of helping the Allied forces combat Soviet aggression, how much it actually contributed to the war, or what kinds of missions it performed, is unknown. When the war came to an end, there were major financial cutbacks to UN military funding, and the agency was no exception to this. However, it was never completely abolished, and stayed as more of a special forces peacekeeping division. The Global Defense Initiative as we know it wouldn't be fully formed until the appearance and spread of Tiberium, and the emergence of the Brotherhood of Nod and its attempts to gain power in third world countries. On October 12, 1995, the United Nations Global Defense Act was passed, establishing GDI as a military organization under the control of the United Nations Security Council. At the time of its establishment, GDI was structured very similarly to most world militaries, though over the years that structure would change. As mentioned, it was initially under the control of the United Nations Security Council and led by the UN Secretary of Defense, who oversaw all aspects of the organization. When it came specifically to conducting and overseeing military operations, however, the organization was led by a commander-in-chief. This general was the highest ranking official in the military branch, but still had to answer to the defense secretary. Over time, GDI as an organization would slowly gain more power and autonomy. It already had many UN member nations incorporate much of their militaries within it. But sometime after the Second Tiberium War in 2030, it would also incorporate nations' civilian infrastructure as well which caused the erosion of the national identities of many countries. 
and also established a council of directors to lead and oversee the organization. This effectively replaced the UN Security Council and its defense secretary. The council had various members, but the major positions on the council were as follows. Director General, Director of the Department of Covert Research and Development, Director of the Treasury, Director of Extraterrestrial Research, and the Director of Public Relations. And there was still a Commander-in-Chief to oversee all military operations. To quote from the GDI Archives Intelligence Database, Over time, power and sovereignty have been gradually ceded to GDI, and the national identities of the participating countries have faded. In 2047, that process has reached its final stages. While there are still technically individual member nations, the reality is that GDI has become a unified political and military superstate. In general, GDI's overall military strategy focuses on a policy of full-spectrum dominance, meaning it is their goal to achieve control over all dimensions of the physical battle space, which includes land, sea, air, and space. In a more detailed sense, GDI puts an emphasis on military and technological R&D. This has allowed them to establish complete supremacy in space, with the creation of the largest space station, the USS Philadelphia, prior to the Second Tiberium War, and the Ion Cannon Network to strike any location around the world. They also developed highly advanced weapons and vehicles, such as mechanized walkers like the Titan Mk-1, and hover tech such as the MLRS. They eventually were able to develop sonic technology to counter the spread of Tiberium, and railguns for their heavy armored vehicles prior to the Third Tiberium War. All this technology allows GDI to bring a large amount of firepower to the battlefield, without needing to rely on large numbers of troops and vehicles like the Brotherhood. GDI prefers to use a brute force method of winning battles, overwhelming their enemies with superior firepower and heavily armored vehicles, and establishing air superiority over the battlefield. Since GDI's original mission was to counter the Brotherhood of Nod, this resulted in major conflicts between the two factions over the years since its formation. These were devastating wars that tested the organization's resolve and its reputation. The first major conflict between GDI and the Brotherhood was the First Tiberium War, which began in the late 1990s and lasted about three years. Under the command of General Mark Jameson Shepard, GDI was tasked with halting Brotherhood takeovers of Third World countries, and the elimination of its leader, Kane. This proved to be difficult, with Kane not only engaging in guerrilla warfare tactics against GDI on all fronts, but also in the use of propaganda, attempting to make the general public believe that GDI were the ones committing war crimes by targeting civilians in conflict zones. Specifically, Nod propaganda framed GDI as responsible for massacring the entire civilian population in the town of Bialystok in Poland. Is that camera still running? Due to the fear of public backlash, the UN cancelled its public funding of the organization, which meant that it had to pull its forces out of many territories, leaving them open to be taken over by Nod forces. Believing that GDI's bases were now severely weakened due to the lack of funds, Kane ordered simultaneous attacks on the organization in order to fully break it. However, it turned out that the UN was bluffing about cancelling the funding, and when Nod forces assaulted these bases, they were caught off guard by the heavily fortified and supplied GDI forces there. This resulted in several major victories for GDI, and gave them time to find Kane and his primary headquarters in Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. GDI assaulted and destroyed the Nod headquarters using the Ion Cannon, the most powerful weapon in their arsenal. Kane was presumed killed with the destruction of the temple, and the Brotherhood was believed to be crippled beyond recovery. Shortly after the First Tiberian War, in 2006, GDI's Milspec Omnibus Agency, which deals with a variety of defense contracts and logistics, signed a 100-year contract with Otani Lincoln Laboratories. OLL was originally a commercial manufacturer, specializing in offshore Tiberium processing platforms. This contract they made with GDI meant that OLL would develop new kinds of all-terrain structures, Structures designed for the next generation of GDI combat and infrastructure facilities. The financial details of this extensive contract are classified. About 30 years after the First Tiberium War, the Brotherhood of Nod would re-emerge as a powerful force once again, assaulting GDI bases throughout the globe and being led by their leader Kane, 
who had survived the destruction of the temple in Sarajevo. This caught GDI completely by surprise, as they had believed the Brotherhood to be splintered, and partially under their control through a deal they had with one of its leaders named Hassan. General James Solomon was the commanding general of GDI's military at the time, overseeing operations from the space station GDSS Philadelphia. Solomon assigned Field Commander Michael McNeil and his team with the task of leading efforts defending and retaliating against the Brotherhood's assaults. During this time period, GDI made use of many new advanced technologies in their arsenal, such as mechanized walkers, hover tanks, drop pods, and sonic weaponry. During the conflict, GDI also received help from a group of Tiberium mutated humans known as the Forgotten. GDI helped rescue their leader, Tratos, from Nod, and in return, the Forgotten helped GDI to destroy Nod's chemical missile plant, as well as a production facility for a new Nod fighter-bomber aircraft called the Banshee. The war would ultimately come to an end when McNeil assaulted the Brotherhood's launch facility in Cairo, Egypt. There, McNeil defeated Kane in hand-to-hand -hand combat, allowing him to rescue a Forgotten named Umagan and preventing the launch of a world-altering missile an ICBM designed to detonate in the Earth's upper atmosphere and convert all carbon-based life on Earth into Tiberium-based life. With the second death of their leader, the Brotherhood became splintered once again, and infighting over who would be the new leader ensued. The second Tiberium War was far shorter than the first, lasting less than a year, but resulted in a massive death toll for both GDI and Nod forces as well as being far more devastating with high civilian casualties and the destruction of many cities around the world. After the Second Tiberium War, GDI began shifting its efforts on stopping the spread of Tiberium infestation, which at this point threatened to make the Earth's atmosphere 100% toxic to humans within a year or less. Dr. Gabriel Boudreau, director of the Daedalus team, a group of scientists tasked with researching Tiberium, with the help of a forgotten named Tratos, all believed that translating an ancient alien artifact known as the Tacitus was humanity's best hope for gaining knowledge on countering Tiberium infestation. Overseeing the recovery operations of the Tacitus was Lieutenant General Paul Cortez at the Southern Cross Command Center in North America. Normally, high-ranking GDI military officials on the Philadelphia would be in charge of such operations, but due to communications with the space station being cut because of heavy ion storms on Earth, Cortez had to step in and take full command temporarily. While GDI was able to recover the Tacitus from the Cairo facility, a powerful Nod AI named Cabal took it upon itself to assassinate Tratos, as the AI perceived him to be a threat against it. This action meant that Cabal had acted in violation of the Brotherhood's inner circle of high-ranking officials, who he then proceeded to eliminate as well. These actions effectively made Cabal a rogue AI, challenging both GDI and Nod with the help of its cyborg army. In order to stop Cabal from destroying humanity, Cortez and the new leader of the Brotherhood, Anton Slavic, formed an unholy alliance with each other. With GDI and Nod's combined strength, they were able to mount a successful assault on Cabal's system core, destroying the rogue AI and its cyborg army for good. This time period would later be known by historians as the Firestorm Crisis, named after the Firestorm Task Force that was put together by General Cortez and led by a young but competent commander. With the threat of Cabal taken care of, and the Brotherhood of Nod splintered and driven underground, GDI could now focus most of its efforts on halting the spread of Tiberium. Although Dr. Boudreau and her team were able to decipher some useful data from the Tacitus, this by itself wasn't enough. In order to fully take on the task of halting the Tiberium infestation, GDI had to cut costs to its military budget, and transfer the funds over to efforts focused on ecological recovery and preservation of the Earth's natural environment as well as investing in technologies like Sonic Residence, which could be used to break down Tiberium crystals at a molecular level, thereby slowing or even halting its spread. Over time, these budget cuts resulted in many base closures around the world, as well as the retirement of much of DDI's advanced technologies, such as the mechanized walkers and hovercraft vehicles. Although some of these technologies would still be around, albeit in smaller numbers and tied to specific divisions within the military such as the Steel Talons Experimental Combat Division and the Zone Operations Command, or ZOCOM. The Steel Talons becoming known for their ruthless efficiency during skirmishes against remnant Nod forces, and ZOCOM being dedicated to operating in regions of high Tiberium infestation in order to halt its growth. These efforts would prove to be successful in reclaiming a portion of Germany, shifting its status from a yellow zone to a blue zone, which was named New Eden. 
During this time period, the national borders had been redrawn based on Tiberium infestation, with uninhabitable red zones representing 30% of the surface of the Earth, yellow zones representing the Tiberium infested but habitable 60% of the Earth, and blue zones representing the last uncontaminated 20% of the Earth, with GDI primarily occupying the blue zones. However, by the time of the year 2043, GDI had closed the majority of its bases. To quote from the GDI archives, As of 2043, GDI has closed over 60% of their military bases around the world, including installations in North Carolina, Brazil, and Eastern Europe. The most recent cutbacks are due to a decrease in Nod activity. With Kane dead, the Brotherhood seems to be splintering apart. This would prove to be a major mistake in the year 2047. For even though GDI would reach its height as the most powerful political and military superstate on the planet, that alone was not enough to prevent the onset of the Third Tiberium War. The Brotherhood of Nod, once again under the leadership of Kane, would start the Third Tiberium War by capturing the Goddard Space Center and disabling GDI's anti-satellite defense network. This allowed a temporary opening for Nod to launch an ICBM missile at the GDSS Philadelphia and destroy it while many of GDI's high-ranking officials and leaders were on board attending an energy summit. This meant that the Director of the Treasury, Redmond Boyle, was escalated to head acting director of GDI. In addition to the destruction of the Philadelphia, Nod forces launched multiple coordinated attacks against Blue Zones around the world. While Redmond Boyle may have been the one in charge of GDI, especially in the eyes of the public. General Jack Granger remained mostly in charge of all its military operations. Through his leadership and skills of the commanders and troops, GDI was able to defend and repel Nod forces from their assaults on the Blue Zones, after which they focused on counterattacking Nod forces. GDI eventually found out the location of Kane and much of Nod's leadership at Temple Prime in Sarajevo, the same temple that GDI had destroyed in the First Tiberium War many years ago. The first siege GDI attempted against the temple failed, as Nod received reinforcements. A second assault on the temple, led by a more competent commander, was successful and able to break through its defenses. However, before assaulting the actual temple structure itself, Director Redmond Boyle ordered it to be destroyed using the Ion Cannon. By doing so, the temple was completely wiped out. However, this detonated liquid Tiberium beneath it, causing a massive explosion which showered Eastern Europe in Tiberium fallout causing massive casualties on the population. With the destruction of Temple Prime, GDI believed they had won the war. However, the massive explosion caught the attention of an alien race known as the Skrin toward Earth. Initially, GDI tried to stop the alien invaders from landing on the planet by using the Ion Cannon Network. However, this failed, and the Skrin ships landed in the Red Zones and immediately began attacking the large population centers of the Blue Zones. These attacks by Skrin forces on these urban centers were devastating. One eyewitness account from GDI Watch Commander Elliot Gruber, stationed in Cologne, gives a report on what the attack by the Skrin was like in the city. By the time we detected the first wave, it was too late to form anything more than a basic defense. Fortunately, we'd been evacuating civilians for the better part of the day, but we were way behind on erecting defensive structures, let alone planning any kind of strategy. Things fell apart fast. Those infernal air, uh, spacecraft came streaking in, wiping out half of our troops before they could even fire a shot. The rest of us scattered, taking shelter in whatever structures we figured were solid enough to withstand fire, at least temporarily. Then the power went out, and with it our communications, and radar, and any damn chance of us taking the city back. GDI quickly scrambled to once again defend the Blue Zones, but soon realized that these assaults were just distractions from the Skrin's true goal which was the construction of large structures known as thresholds. Though GDI did not understand the purpose of these towers, they weren't going to wait to find out. They then focused their attacks on all 19 of these towers and were successful in destroying 18 of them before they were completed. The last tower, known as Threshold 19, was completed, making it invulnerable to GDI attacks. This was no thanks to the fanatical Brotherhood defending the tower alongside the Skrin, allowing for whatever was left of the alien force to retreat through it. Ultimately, the Skrin would be defeated when GDI destroyed a powerful relay node that the invaders had built. This node emitted Tiberium-based radiation, which powered the Skrin's troops and vehicles. With the destruction of the node, the Skrin could no longer receive its power, causing the collapse of their forces. 
with the Skrin harvesting force defeated and what's left of Nod's remaining forces driven underground. GDI once again emerged as the victors of the Third Tiberium War. A few years of peace ensued, in which GDI focused on rebuilding its military and reconstruction of the Blue Zones. But they would be caught by surprise in 2052, when Nod forces suddenly assaulted the Rocky Mountains complex, which contained the now unstable Tacitus. Despite the heavy resistance put up by GDI forces, Nod was able to penetrate the complex and capture the Tacitus, which was now in the hands of Kane. The assault on the Rocky Mountains complex did not result in any other major conflicts with the Brotherhood, which allowed GDI to continue focusing on their rebuilding efforts and holding back the spread of Tiberium. Though this has proven to be very difficult, such as with New Eden, the once reclaimed Yellow Zone turned Blue Zone, once again becoming completely overtaken by Tiberium in the year 2052. Thanks to research and data gathered from captured Skrin technology, many scientists now believe that the Skrin forces that landed on Earth were not a full invasion force, but were instead part of a mining operation to harvest the Earth's Tiberium, and therefore were not expecting such stiff resistance by GDI. But if just a small force of Skrin miners could cause so much destruction, then a full invasion force would be fully capable of wiping out the entire human race. Though scientists believe that Threshold Tower 19 will remain dormant indefinitely, GDI remains wary of this prediction and continues monitoring of the tower at all times, keeping its military at the ready in case the worst happens and a full Skrin invasion force comes through. But if they do, the people of Earth will know that the Global Defense Initiative are the ones that will be there to protect them. They bested the Brotherhood of Nod and its fanatical leader Kane in three wars. And with the experience gained fighting the Skrin, and a better understanding of their technology, GDI stands as the last, best hope for humanity.